Good evening and welcome to Slam the Gavel, the show that tells it all regarding family court, court and CPS issues. I'm your host, Marianne Petrie. And since 2016, Monica Shimonik has been coaching moms and dads as they navigate through the treacherous waters of the family law racket. Aside from workshops, which help with specific problems, her 12-week signature course, The Best Interest of the Parent, uses a four-quadrant model to create a robust healing and empowerment system so that you control the narrative in your life, not the state. Use coupon code SLAMTHEGAVEL to get 10% off the course, and the, this will all be included in the website notes. Now, I have a very special guest. Her name is Melissa Toon, and she is a survivor of domestic violence who has a unique perspective due to almost unbelievable personal experiences in North Carolina and West Virginia related to coercive control, family court corruption, law enforcement as a tool of abuse, child abuse, and frequent encounters with fraud, bias, and injustice. She is the creator of Surviving Post-Separation Abuse and Parenting in Context of Coercive Control on Facebook and Mamas in Pursuit of Happiness on YouTube. She is a self-represented litigant who has empowered herself by supporting others with knowledge previously unknown to the average pro se litigant. She is also a mom who has been prevented from protecting her child while in the confines of the family court and child protection systems. Formerly a licensed practical nurse and paralegal, she was sent to prison for her first offense as a result of acts of violence post-separation from an abuser. And this happens often. There's a lot of people don't know what goes on with these family court cases. So I'm going to let Melissa Toon, and I welcome you to educate us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne, for having me. Happy to be here. I'm so glad um, you're here because we need to talk about the lack of integrity related to family law attorneys and judges. Definitely so. Everybody, you know, in, in, our, in our groups talk about the corruption of these judges, but what we're not talking about is the lack of overall integrity of the legal profession in the confines of the family court system and of child protection and domestic violence. Um, you know, somewhere along the way, it became, it had become a business mm -hmm. instead of a means of protection and safety and, uh, and, and ensuring the next generation peace and a lack of overall trauma and abuse. And um, I truly believe that there are answers and there are resolutions that are available for us and um, in this movement of mostly mothers. Mm -hmm. There are definitely things that we can do uh, in our own little, um, own little worlds, our own corner of um, the world. Mm -hmm. to make a change a little bit at a time. Um, so a little bit about me. Definitely tell us. Okay. After staying in a, a place of pain and living in a coercively controlling dynamic for over a decade, it took a lot of healing and I became strengthened through solitude and faith and a higher power. And through that, the devastation and the isolation it really has brought me to the knowledge that clarified what I view as basically a money scheme. By using the pain of survivors of domestic violence and control and their desperation to protect their children from abuse. Um, when these attorneys that we are hiring to help us and and the attorney situation has really given me a perspective on my own situation because for years i planned on being an attorney and this understanding has has pushed me away from that quite a bit because what is an attorney these days um and i, I do you know that could, that's kind of getting ahead of myself um, but to tell you all a little bit about me, um, 
I'm originally from Charleston, West Virginia, and I have experienced so many unbelievable, unreal abuses of power and just overall abuse in society that um, it's, it's really given me a very unique perspective as Marianne stated. I was sent to prison for my first offense after I sold pills to pay my rent. Uh, I was hit by a vehicle as a pedestrian with an act of protective order by my first child's father, many years post-separation. And that led me to this criminal act and this poor choice, which in turn not healed at that time, led me to another abuser here in North Carolina. And although I was given probation, once I tried to leave the dynamic of abuse and control by this man who is a former All-American athlete, a career criminal, and the most dangerous of abuser, he created a scenario for me to be violated on probation and I was sent to prison. Um, I spent 18 months in prison for my first and only offense. And um, once I left the prison, when I no longer wished to be in that dynamic, this family court nightmare ensued. Um, just a lot of, lot of trauma, a lot of fear following what I thought was the truth, asserting my knowledge to be the truth, and being met with contempt and a complete disregard for humanity and of protection. And um, before you know, I was sent away, I was a licensed practical nurse. I had been in school for paralegal and criminal justice. And even in prison, I was helping women write letters to their attorneys. I was writing senators and the governor to be moved because I was in a jail because the prison was full and I was the lowest level of offenders. And I knew I just wanted to help people. I knew that this wasn't fair, uh, but it took me definitely a lot of healing, a lot of solitude to understand exactly what happened to me and to see that before I had come to a place of healing and of just really thriving, I wasn't, I wasn't aware and I wasn't able to properly communicate the devastation and the terror we were enduring. And that definitely gave me a view on what the court system views as stability is actually someone who's not being abused. And um, obviously the mother is constantly destabilized and debilitated and degraded. Mm -hmm. and, and this is mothers in family court. And she asserts her knowledge and begs for help. Uh, there's, there's kind of a scheme that goes on of perpetuating this instability to capitalize upon it, to perpetuate a high conflict, um, high conflict narrative that continues the suffering. Um, so when I had healed from, you know, the pain, the terror and the fear, which is actually every day a healing process, I can't say I'm completely healed because mm -hmm. It takes a long time. I don't think really anyone can, can totally heal from the trauma of family court. Yeah, I agree. Um, so what I, I first want to really highlight is something that everyone in this situation needs to know is that these family court actors are not doing anything in your or your child's best interest. When you pay an attorney, no matter how exorbitant or low of the amount that you pay, you are 
engaging in a, in a contract where you believe that this person is going to be a zealous advocate for your child's and your well-being. In reality, that's that's not what's happening. Um, and the way I've I've understood this was through my own personal experiences as a mostly self-represented litigant, and that's not by choice. I've had mm -hmm. attorneys just take my money and ghost me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's no kind of repercussions with the bar. There's no kind of help in our situations where we're devastated financially. Um, and through remembering the things that they told me and then in, in my own personal education, obtaining the rules of the court and the rules of civil procedure and additionally the laws for custody and abuse and neglect and in North Carolina, it's the general statutes. I reflected on every single conversation that I'd ever had with attorneys I went to for assistance. And the first thing I realized that even if somebody had told me something to help me and they didn't properly do it or handle it themselves just to give me advice, I was too traumatized to even do anything. Mm -hmm. I was too, and I was in so much fear. I was just completely unstable emotionally because of what I knew my child was enduring, mm -hmm. what I knew to be true for a fact. And I needed help desperately. So anybody that could do anything, I was just like, here, take my money, do it, you know? And that's where this lack of integrity comes in. Because what I found when I read the rules was no one told me of the many options that I had to get things done. No one told me that there were numerous motions for appropriate relief instead of an appeal that could be filed within a, a so long of a statute. That there were certain ways, well, not certain ways, that there is a way by subpoena of the custodian of records for any agency, medical, public records, to have an affidavit that these records are actually legitimate to where they have to be admitted into evidence if they're proper and they have a, you know, grounds for admittance. And in numerous times when I was denied the ability to show the judge something like here, look at this here. I might put this, you know, I had no idea that they weren't given me the equal playing field that they were the other party who was being held to this low standard meet. And at the same time, I'm held to this high standard of an attorney not having any knowledge and not being told that I must follow these rules or else they're not going to help me. But they didn't tell me that. They didn't say, well, you didn't follow the rules on this, so we're not going to let this evidence in. They didn't say that we're, gonna, we're not going to let you file an appeal because it's not within this in this motion and this um, pleading, it's not possible. You'd have to file this motion. They pretend that that's giving legal advice. Sorry, I can't help you. I can't give you legal advice. That's the clerk, right? Mm -hmm. And the judge didn't say, I'm sorry, we're going to dismiss this and we're going to deny this because you didn't follow the procedure. Instead, we're left feeling this is corrupt. This is wrong. It's so unfair. I'm devastated. They won't even look at my child's horrible records and these photos. And, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me even file an appeal or come do this. And you just think that it's like, they're just outright fraudulent. Mm -hmm. But in reality, which there is a ton of fraud. And in my case, there's been a lot of fraud, but in a lot of cases, it's the fact that we just don't know. Mm -hmm. what the procedure is and no one's going to tell us because mm -hmm. they need this to continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they'll always say, if you call like a, the clerk's office or whatever, and you'll say, well, you know, what do I do next? Well, you know, they'll give you some type of answer, but they'll say, you know, you really should ask your lawyer. <laughs> and it's like, well, I can't afford one. <laughs> Everybody says that I've been told that something you really need to talk to your lawyer. And and, and specifically in North Carolina, there are it is it is basically an understood it's it's part of law, it's part of the grants, it's part of the agencies that domestic violence victims are to get free legal assistance through legal aid. And if legal aid isn't available, then other agencies would be available. Well, I'm here to say that that's not happening. 
um, because of conflict, of a conflict of interest due to other agencies' liabilities of harm of us, everybody just decided that they couldn't help me. And it was like a joke that nobody let me in on. And it was just like kind of a complete humiliation because in the background there was a institutional slandering of my credibility going on mm -hmm. because I continued to assert the facts and I wasn't aware of the proper procedure to get these facts understood at the same time. The court is going with the belief that CPS and the police investigated. They would have done something if what you are saying is happening is happening. Therefore, you're making false allegations. So if you go in and you're asserting that your child has been sexually abused or abused in any way, and say you just uncovered some records, like in my case, I did. I found them myself. I uncovered that no one had investigated and you assert these findings in the court with no kind of procedure which in an abuse and neglect and dependency chapter of your state law would say what the escalation process is that certain people were responsible for doing something in this matter and if they didn't do it because of their lack of you know any investigation or care or their coercion or the interference from the abuser making false allegations against you so they just decided they're not looking into it the court is going to regard you as not credible and in my case there the court orders the family the family court orders in my case this is forsyth county north carolina are a complete defamation of my character and a complete disregard for the facts and really empowering abuse and the abuser, allowing him to assert, he said, she said, false narrative and lies about his life and his stability, putting them into findings and allowing his false narrative and portraying me in a false negative light, his false statements um, to, be, to become findings of fact which can then be taken out in the community to your, your child's school, mm -hmm. your family, everyone you know, to say, look what was really true, look what's really happening. Where's that gonna leave you? With mm -hmm. no support, everybody thinks you're a monster. And I mean, they slandered me in the court order. So what, there are legal remedies for that, that you can, you can do you know, pretty quickly to address that, but no one tells you that. Mm -hmm. No one tells you that. And for an attorney that wishes to capitalize upon whatever legalities or liabilities that you have in your, you know, your assets, it's very easy for someone to take advantage of women in this situation. Mm -hmm. And it is so important to educate yourself or else you're just blind and blissfully ignorant. And your suffering is that of the blissful ignorance because you don't have to suffer. Uh, as much as you are, not to say that you won't suffer knowing the truth, mm -hmm. but I think it'll be a little bit less of a degree. It's good to educate yourself, and I think the one thing you want to get your hands on first is the Black's Law Dictionary. That's yeah. very, yeah, very helpful. Uh, there's, is what happened to you, there was no due process. No, complete denial of my Fifth Amendment right to due process. And, and something else that I want to touch on is our constitutional rights. Fourteenth Amendment, equal protection under color of law. Um, the Eighth Amendment right to be free of cruel and unusual punishment. The Fifth Amendment right to be, you know, to have due process under color of law. And I have been denied all of those rights. Most women have. Um, and, and also something that, you know, in addition to Black's law, Elon University actually gave me a once a week password for three hours. I don't have any more to give out. I'm sorry to everybody in my area. If you try, I'll share my resources with you. Um, but Westlaw, Westlaw is going to give you case law. It's going to give you, you know, sample pleadings and motions. And also what I did was go to the local public library and you're going to want to get the trial practice guide and book 
for your state and that's going to show you what your motions are supposed to look like. It's going to show you the wordings and it's going to show you what the judge's orders can be formed as and it's also going to give you case law and in addition to the rules of court and rules of civil procedure there are little teeny things that say you have to quote the rule that you're asserting in your motion that can be your appeal can be denied based on you not following rules and guess what no one even told you about it mm -hmm. you just go in there thinking and knowing you know the truth and because of some little sam little rule that you didn't follow that no one actually told you mm -hmm. you needed to follow you lose it all and you've spent all this money your child suffered and so have you and i really feel that this needs to that practice needs to be made unconstitutional mm -hmm. if we are forcing victims to represent themselves due to conflicts of agencies who are liable for harm mm -hmm. and we put her in this arena of she's being attacked by an, a man that wants to dominate and humiliate her by taking her children coercive controlling mm -hmm. false allegations false reports financial abuse stalking hurting the children on visits neglect interfering in her parenting and the list goes on you can find that list um, at the battered women's justice project and there are charts and explanations for the parenting in context of coercive control and that is available on google um this is what's happening in family court and if we're just saying that domestic violence only exists when you're in the violence mm -hmm. and it doesn't exist when you leave even though you see the murders of those beautiful women and children just piling up on your mm -hmm. feed every day mm -hmm. well guess what the states aren't even recognizing those as domestic violence because there's no option and this is for north carolina specifically i'm sure this is probably the case in other states there is a duty of law enforcement to note the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim and there are no options for estranged husband estranged lover ex-boyfriend father of child there are options for unknown and other and those are the highest options that are marked and so there's all this funding going in for violence against women and and victims of crime and all of this but those in those that are responsible for the protection of the citizens are deciding that those aren't victims that she left it's over everything's fine now she just has to go through court and on this side of the agencies we're going to decide that she's just making false allegations that is obviously a flawed belief that has harmed and killed many mm -hmm. um yeah that's just super crazy and it's something things that i'm just figuring out myself so happy to share it well the th i don't know if you had to go through this but it's the traumatic emotional states of mothers who have suffered through domestic violence and the judge orders co-parenting <laughs> yes yes that is something that i have definitely definitely seen constantly in these cases even if a mother doesn't even realize that she's a victim of domestic violence which a lot of coercive controlling cases women don't even know they're being controlled Mm -hmm. even they left i was under control till last year and i had no idea i thought i was free from it that was not the case and obviously if you're co-parenting with somebody who is not safe for children um your children are going to be coming back to you and expressing the pain and suffering and you're not going to be stable and at the same time you're supposed to have a nice dialogue with this abuser sociopath psychopath rapist whatever he did to you psychological mm -hmm. abuser um and if you don't play nice and if you don't do what he says because it's ordered you're viewed as the problem and then any and, and this is common even though we do have a legal ability to come in and order a man to be psychologically evaluated and drug tested they're not doing that but they're doing it to the women first because it's misogyny Mm -hmm. It's an, a lack of equal protection. It's a lack of, of equal rights, you know, of women and men. Men have power, women don't. If a man comes to court and wants his children, he must be a doting father. These beliefs of shared parenting are based on two parents that are safe 
and honest, and obviously they wouldn't be in court fighting if that was the case. Mm -hmm. So we, and this is constant for all of the women. And in my group, I have over a thousand women and I've talked to hundreds of women. I've sat, I've court watched, I've, I've read their cases. It is a standard for the opposition and for the court as a whole to view her as mentally unfit based on the abuse that she is receiving throughout the legal system and the legal abuse of this man who is asserting his rights, his rights to be a parent based on whatever, you know, um, whatever laws are right now saying that there's equal 50, 50, that the people have a right to their children if they're a parent. Where is the protection for those that are abusing the children and the parent? And that is the something that has just been thrown to the wayside. It feels like from reading that happened around like 98, 99, when, you know, abusers started getting access because the father's rights movement. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not discounting a good man and a good father. He obviously puts in work, but let's just be honest. Who has the emotional attachment and who put, went through the pain and the love and the nourishing and the caring for a child? Mm -hmm. Who is going to have that bond? Not to say that men don't have these bonds, but a good man absent a woman who is dangerous and unhealthy that has been proven from the jump. We can't just assert this halfway through. We can't just say she's unstable after she was an amazing mother and a wife and say a nurse or a therapist or a teacher who was a, a brownie troop leader and a soccer coach. Now, all of a sudden, she's unstable. Let's give her a new psych diagnosis. And that's the way to give this abusive man access to terrorize mm -hmm. the children and perpetuate, and the mother, specifically the mother, because this is meant to denigrate her. This is meant to completely dominate her life because she left. We need to show her who's boss. And if she came into the court and told the truth about this abusive man, he needs to gain his control back. He's losing it. She is starting to value herself enough to speak out. He needs to make sure that nobody listens and he'll do everything in his power to do so. And the lack of acknowledgement of this by the courts is devastating mm -hmm. to mothers and children. It is. It takes control, especially when the first silver bullet they shoot out at the mother is she's mentally ill. Definitely. And as we talked earlier, how does a nurse who's worked in a job setting, because if you were mentally ill as a nurse, you would have been fired a long time ago. Exactly. Okay. And I yeah. So how does a, a, a nurse, you know, just what, go batshit crazy overnight? Is that, is that what happens? And this is going to work. And what judge would, you know, but these judges acknowledge this. And they let the father say this on the stand while he's crying crocodile tears, saying he just wants his children to be safe. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, and there's ways to, you know, impeach him as a witness to show that he's dishonest, but they're not, they're not showing, they're not telling us that. And obviously, if we are focusing on solely a woman's credibility based on her emotional state, if we're not bringing in real professionals that have an awareness of traumatic responses by victims, CPTSD, you know, um, this situational depression through legal, legal um, abuse, which is constant. And when there's no prevention or acknowledgement of false allegations, false reports, slander, defamation, harassment, and giving this man more of a platform to do this because he's a man. Mm -hmm. He's a man. He's here for these children. So she must be horribly wrong. She's got to be, you know, the issue. Um, obviously, if that's happening all over the world, it's, it's part of this high conflict custody scam. It's a scheme. And if we decided from the beginning, when we see, and this happened in my case, they knew he was on drugs. He was refusing drug tests. Um, he was catching, getting criminal, being charged with criminal acts. 
including driving on a revoked impaired license, um, found to be taking, doing cocaine, selling cocaine, um, lying to the police, and all of these other things. And they knew it. And they knew that he was making false statements about me. They knew that he was acting as a quote unquote gatekeeper to my child. They knew that he was talking negatively about me in her presence. And they knew that he wasn't honest with the court or anyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That wasn't going to perpetuate this conflict. So when I had gotten custody back based on him violating orders and making egregious false claims of sexual abuse by me of my daughter, even though there was evidence that it would, it was a person in his home. Um, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't acknowledged and said how egregious it was and how this man obviously is unstable psychologically to have made that kind of a claim. They, I had con I had gotten custody back. Um, and it was probably the second week that I had her back. She's expressing sexually explicit, you know, wording and actions that alarmed me. And, and I really, you know, I had no support. I had no idea what that was going to happen or the process of it. All I knew was I needed to protect her and I ran to the court. And that is a huge mistake for moms like me because that's how we lose our children. And I did lose her like that. Mm. Even though we knew he was all these things, this judge, judge Gordon Miller, who has threatened me with jail dozens of times. Um, he has discredited me throughout numerous court orders all because I came to the court emotionally to protect my daughter. He ignored everything we had found in these court orders about this man for the last year, ordered a new GAL report, a new investigation, removed her from my custody, would not even let me say goodbye to her, handed her over to my ex, the abuser's mother, gave me two hours supervised, two, two hours supervised visitation with her a week at a place where my ex had access to her and everyone else had access to her as well. I was discredited because I had, I didn't call witnesses. I didn't have the police and DSS there. I didn't have anybody there. All I knew was this was happening. I was desperate. Nobody did anything in the past. And it's obviously still going on. Well, I had been punished for that ever since. And then recently in the last year, after being slandered and after the court completely smearing my name, it was an assassination of my character stating that it was substantiating I abused her, that I'm bipolar, that I'm homeless, that I, I mean, and it was, I was missing, like, it was just like, they had been to my house. They, I was missing class that day to be there. And they said, I'm thinking about quitting my job and maybe going to school. Like it was just outright slander lies. And I was completely devastated by that. Obviously I was going to sue the children's law center for slandering me and abusing and slaring, smearing negligence, you know, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Mm -hmm. Then I hire an attorney that needs to earn his place back at the court. And mm -hmm. he tells me to handle my own investigation and do my own subpoenas. Well, guess what? I investigated and I found the mother load. Mm -hmm. I found, I did a blanket medical record search of all the health systems within a hundred mile radius for my child. I found almost 600 pages of medical records. I had asserted as my knowledge as a nurse, I knew she was sick. I knew there was a problem that every single time I tried to get her help, they would start projecting and blaming. She's trying to make, she's trying to get these um, medical exams of my child, like I'm Munchausen's or something. Mm -hmm. My child has severe medical issues and I'm talking severe. So obviously this is a lot of evidence. I also, um, I also uncovered numerous other records, 911 records of domestic violence happening between him and his girlfriend now while my child's present numerous other criminal records that I was unaware of him assaulting another female. And I mean, he's kidnapped my daughter. It's just been an all out attack. And this is because that attorney I hired to sue had, had engaged in a perpetuation of this defamation of my character. And it was an institutionally slandering situation that followed me to another state as I tried to protect her because other attorneys got involved because there's other forms of litigation that include that are, that are basically 
my assets from the suffering that we have endured. And these, these abusers of power, this, you know, uh, basically an abuse of generosity to pretend to help me just to get with the other, get with the opposition and, and help the abuse. And it took me a long time to understand and realize that. And I mean, by organ, by investigating myself, I have the evidence, I have the proof and that, that means a lot. And I strongly suggest everyone in my position to do your own investigation, because if you don't, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. There are definitely a lot of ways for you to get the information that you seek and that, you know, you think that it's, it's not available to you. It definitely is available to you. Mm -hmm. Well, also th there's issues of, you know, there's no cameras in the courtrooms. There's no tamper proof mics. There's no jury. This is just a bad, bad recipe for disaster in itself. That just met, reminded me of something. What I recently found in the North Carolina laws and procedures, you can have a jury trial for custody. They just didn't tell you about that. As long as you demand it or you make your motion within, I believe it's 10 days of the last service or the pleading mm -hmm. for a trial, you can have a jury for custody. And I am willing to bet that a lot of other states have that available and they just didn't tell you. They can't deny you that. That is your right to have a trial by jury. That is actually a constitutionally protected right. And in addition to, you know, the mics being covered up and no cameras, I recorded myself, judges who didn't think that anybody ever heard what they did to me and it's been played on, you know, a weekly court corruption update with Michael Volpe. Um, and after that, I've been in the courtroom and they threatened me with jail again. I was belittled and degraded and the judge was like, you better not talk bad about me on Facebook. I was just like, well, <laughs> he said that. And I was like, I'm going to keep getting louder and louder. He said, is that a threat? I was like, no, it's my only option. I'm trying to be a mother and protect my child and you won't let me. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've gotten to a place where obviously I've been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I've been falsely arrested and assaulted by law enforcement. And this is all through domestic violence. So mm -hmm. I've become the perpetrator as I've tried to free myself from the violence. And something that I really want to share with everyone is when they're issuing these gag orders, threatening you with contempt of court and saying, we're, we're going to give you 30 days in jail, or we're going to give you fines. And mm -hmm. you're, you're ordered by the court to do these certain things. Mm -hmm. Guess what? they're unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. You have a right to freedom of speech. And I am not telling everybody just to, to ignore your court orders, but they're, if they're unfair and if they are against all of everything you feel inside and you need to speak out about these uh, atrocities that are happening to you and your children, I strongly suggest you ignore the gag orders. Mm -hmm. I suggest that you ignore the contempt threats and mm -hmm. you tell them that you'll happily sit there and wait for a civil rights attorney for what they're doing to your constitutional rights and authority. Learn your constitution, mm -hmm. assert your constitution, know what the laws are when it comes to domestic violence and when it comes to child abuse, neglect, and dependency in your state, know the laws. So when they say, oh, I'm sorry, this custody order over supersedes your protective order. I'm sorry, Your Honor, and this is how Judge Miller recused himself on my motion in the court after he threatened me with jail and destroyed my credibility in the court. He inter even interfered afterwards, and he's still, you know, doing his thing. I knew that the protective order trumped the court orders for custody if they were ordered after the custody order. And I asserted that knowledge, and that is the only reason. He recused himself, mm -hmm. even though he didn't write that in the order. He said it in the, in the hearing because I recorded it. And I've definitely been threatened for that afterwards. Like they took my phone at the last hearing, which is, you know, that's a legal search and seizure. You have mm -hmm. no right to take my phone and turn it off. If everyone else in this courtroom can have their phones, I can too. Um, and there's numerous other ways. And that definitely needs to be a constitutionally protected right 
to have document audio and video of court proceedings because they can do hit on, hit off, whatever they want to do, whatever they want. I mean, I got audio of him having ex parte communications, violating all my rights, refusing to look at evidence. He gave my daughter back to my ex while he was being arrested in the courtroom for violating our protective order. When I got her back, and this was last year, when I got her back, she had been physically assaulted. She had a slap mark across her face. She had been harmed by what this judge did as he asserted that he knew all by basing his belief on everybody else did the investigation, which obviously they're not doing investigations or this wouldn't be happening to so many people, mm -hmm. so many women and children. I got that protective order in, Gil in Greensboro. And that was around the time where this one attorney, Reginald Alston, had began this uh, slandering, this defamation of my character, portraying me in this false negative light, like I just make false claims all the time and I'm unstable and I want to, to do my own cases and I argue with attorneys or whatever he was saying about me. Mm -hmm. Like he intentionally caused scenes in the courthouse between him and I to portray me to those around. And I didn't even realize it then. And this protective order due to his lies to me about what the pr process was of getting the new records in the court order, the venue was then transferred back to the county where that judge was because they needed to cover up that order because it showed that what he did harmed us. It also showed that I found records that nobody investigated after they had discredited me for years and refused to help us. Um, in addition to me locating or, or finding hard evidence, direct evidence of fraud by the clerks in the Forsyth County Courthouse, like legitimately hard proof of fraud, like changing numbers putting motions in the wrong file and when i went and got copies of all of the court files meaning protective orders and custody orders what i found was complete manipulation and fraud of the file i did not even find the protective order that said my child was assaulted and that gave him no contact they ordered me to be the guardian ad litem they're hiding orders they're changing things and unless you go and you know overcome this fear of what's going to happen, your fear of failure, how traumatized you are of being ridiculed and invalidated at, and really just like humiliated, um, degraded, degradation. When you come in and your power and your confidence and you build your confidence back up and you detach and ground yourself from all of this pain and these emotions and your child suffering, you are able to find information like that. You can go in making copies of all these things. You can pay for the copies. Know your ability and your rights to, to proceed. Do not just listen to what the clerks or the attorneys or the judges tell you as, as fact. Go find out for yourself because I'll guarantee you there are a different set of facts. <laughs> Definitely. And you will also find there will be things missing out of your docket. Yes, yes, there are tons of things <laughs> missing and added into my docket. And there's even documents saying what they removed and that they gave me the notice to an address I didn't live at. There are, I mean, I kept my own records throughout the time. So I have all the missing documents and strong advice is to make three copies of every document you have, yes. scan it into a hard drive and record every conversation with everyone you have regarding your case <laughs> and back it up. <laughs> Definitely. But, yeah. And that's but awesome I, advice that, you know, people, I think a lot of uh, women and good men are literally with the CPTSD it's like I, they want to investigate their case and do more. And some of them are just emotionally paralyzed to even yes. think about looking at the courthouse. Yes, I was like that for a long time. I was terrified to even go by it. Mm -hmm. I was just like a feeling of complete helplessness and of what they're going to do next. So mm -hmm. I have taken a lot of time, and this is advice for everyone, self-love, self-care, detaching from the emotions of not being able to protect or assert the truth and your, your desperate innate need to protect your children, to detach from that 
to right now for this moment, not feel guilty because you're not doing something right now to, to help them. Mm -hmm. that you're not scrambling around really you're in you know a hamster wheel because it's all emotional so when you start building your confidence and your self-esteem back up that real i am i know what i am i'm capable of mm -hmm. and you see the other parties for what they truly are which is actors and abusers mm -hmm. and you stand in your power and you you know gain this knowledge of how to proceed things are really change. And I mean, just taking time for yourself, period, and completely cutting people off that invalidate you, mm -hmm. even family, family right. and friends, people that act like you're not telling the truth, or you must have done something wrong, or they don't want to hear your chaos, your all your drama and your mm -hmm. stories, cut, next, goodbye. Even mm -hmm. if it's someone who you feel that you owe a relationship to even your mother, your father, sister, your brother, your daughter, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Even children, I mean, it, that have been in an abusive dynamic for a long time, start to harm the survivor in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. And in my case, my teenage daughter is, you know, basically brainwashed by the abuser. It's like Stockholm syndrome mm -hmm. because she, he started grooming her when I went off and he sent me to prison. He, he knew that was a way to get in and he couldn't have me. He was going to have my little girls. And that's, you know, what his aim was. So obviously that's a lot of, a lot of trauma, a lot of sadness, a lot of like really feeling hopeless and helpless. Um, my strongest advice is to get a great therapist, mm -hmm. um, and a psychologist, psychiatrist, if you need that and to get in support groups try to stay in today yesterday's history and tomorrow's a mystery so mm -hmm. do you want something to be different you can't stay in the negativity we know what they're doing wrong unless it's when you're talking about the the negative parts and the problems unless you're coming up with a solution for them there's no need to even talk or think about them Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's good to get it out to vent to someone, mm -hmm. but from personal experience, people overall get tired of hearing all of the problems mm -hmm. when you get in the solution. And I know that's hard for a lot of us as we're so traumatized by this, when you're stepping into your healing and, and something I definitely want to add is getting into a relationship with your higher power. Whoever that is, if that's God, if that's Buddha, if that's a higher version of yourself, whatever that is, get into that and break free from this e egotistical process of feeling because of things that are happening and really just know that this just is, and you can take a step further to free yourself and have some peace. That's very true because you've got to hold yourself together and you almost have to detach your emotions. Yes. And go into that courthouse and 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 treat it like a business, because they do. Yep, yeah, right. And it's just a business. Yep, and just get your paperwork and whatever you need. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's I had to get transcript after transcript, and I had to walk past that family courtroom door that I had been in, and it was just like, okay, just keep going. Don't even look in there. Just go up and get the transcript and go home. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And another thing is to, you know, own your own stuff. We, as, as victims, we make mistakes. We're human. We're emotional. We're broken, you know? And so sometimes along the way we get angry and we do things and we rub people or things the wrong way, or we, you know, we make mistakes. So when we own that and learn from that and say, you know what, I did that take responsibility for what you've done because you're not completely free from, you know, responsibility in every aspect. Even if you are the innocent victim in this dynamic and all you're trying to do is assert the truth, there were times when you weren't able to properly think or communicate mm -hmm. that you were a blubber. I mean, I can, I can remember numerous times where I just sobbed in the courtroom. I couldn't even talk. Mm -hmm. I was just sobbing and crying. I was hysterical mm -hmm. and numerous other times, even speaking to law enforcement and other people that could have helped me. Mm -hmm. I just perpetuated this false portrayal of me to be unstable because I was rambling. I mm -hmm. didn't stop. I was crying, rambling. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't hear anything. 
I couldn't, I had to step away. I had to let go a little bit because we don't have control of anything except how we respond to things. Mm -hmm. When we respond in a way that is practical and in reality, it doesn't give the, oppor the, uh, the other side an opportunity to use your mental state against you once you realize that that's what they're going to do every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And we've got to get past the fear of these judges saying, uh, if you keep that up, I'm going to send you up to the fourth floor, which is like jail, right? And it's, that's fine, know. Your Honor. I'll happily sit there for the truth. When you learn how to assert your evidence and assert right. your rights, you know? <laughs> definitely, definitely. It's it's a scare tactic. And just you, they you, love have it. To yeah, you have to stand your ground. They are corrupt. They know they're corrupt. And at some point, this is all going to come to an end, hopefully within... I'm hoping 15 years, maybe, maybe sooner. I think I it'll be less than that. Honestly, I, I view family court judges as a very egotistical group because look at the power they have over women and children. When you see these, you know, Supreme Court of Appeals or Superior Court or Upper Court judges that obviously have people's lives in their hands mm -hmm. uh, to send them to prison to, you know, and then we give them all an attorney, the people that we send to prison. But you over here, we can send you to jail and threaten you, but we didn't give you an attorney first to argue that, but we can use that threat. And if they're going to hold you in criminal contempt, you have to have an attorney. That is your right to have an attorney if there's criminal contempt proceeding. That I'm talking about like, it, you know, um, a public defender is supposed to be assigned to you if you're being threatened with criminal charges, which is criminal contempt, being jail. And it's, it's really, it's like a small man, like a Napoleon complex thing, it feels like. An egotistical, you know, power. And not to say every family court judge is in that mindset, mm -hmm. but if we can elect a, a judge who doesn't even have to be an attorney or have any experience with family or anything just based on votes. And some of them run uncontested, are appointed by the governor, spearhead of the father's rights movement, Judge Gordon Miller, um, NRA Republican who has some secrets himself. Mm -hmm. And he is abusive to litigants. And I mean, he's completely just immoral in his, in his actions with litigants, yet he has been able to go all this time and it really i have a perspective into his psychology it's really really unhealthy <laughs> right, right and this is who is responsible for deciding what is safe for your children and not and you're up here with this you i think these judges need psychological evaluations to be and honest I, I, think I think that could be something that we could push for i think they should also be drug tested yes for sure follicle drug tests mm -hmm, yes mm -hmm. and i think it should be a, a prerequisite i mean it goes for law enforcement as well attorneys mm -hmm. um and how you can engage an attorney's honesty and integrity is to ask them a series of questions that you already know the answers to. Say you do a little research in your court rules or your rules of civil procedure or the law, and you know that there are 16 ways and remedies for these things. And you go into a consult or whatever, and you act clueless like we mostly are when we get into this situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then see how they answer you. And then you have your answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how can people reach you if they have any questions for you? Um, I have um, a support group on Facebook called Surviving Post-Separation Abuse and Parenting in Context of Coercive Control. And I have an, a YouTube called Mamas in Pursuit of Happiness. And due to tech abuse, I really don't have, I'm not on those platforms a lot. I try to just post and get off so they can be shared. But uh, my email address is mamasmanifesting at gmail.com. That's M-A-M-A-S manifesting at gmail.com. Okay. And I will put that in the podcast notes as well. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we part? Let's see. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I could add a lot more. Maybe next time. Oh, um, I'll, I definitely will have you on next time. <laughs> yeah. Remember that <laughs> attorneys have the ability to demand a jury in most cases, object and impeach witnesses, 
push court to make rulings and not let the continuances increase your amount of emotional ability to bring in experts to get the court to order drug and psychological evaluations for the opposition to get evidence in to investigate and to obtain all records so you know. definitely definitely <laughs> well thank you so much uh don't hop off Slam the Gavel is a podcast to help the public understand what really goes on in the family courtrooms. I'm your host, Marianne Petrie, author of Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, <clears throat> and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth. Please join us again with uh, Melissa in the future and other guests. So I thank you again, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. I really had a great time. And you'll be back. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>